Welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast, made for women who want their healthiest years to be ahead of them, not behind them. Join your host, Courtney Townley, right now as she breaks down the fairy tale health story you have been chasing all of your life into sensible action steps and lasting change. Hello, hello, and welcome to the Grace and Grit Podcast. This is your host, Courtney Townley. As always, thank you so much for taking time to be here. I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I hope you will get a lot out of today's episode. Now, before I go on today, I just want to acknowledge that many of you over the past couple of weeks have sent me private emails and DMs on Instagram and Facebook which I love. I absolutely adore hearing from you and knowing that the message of the podcast is landing. And I would ask of you to please rate and review the podcast on iTunes if you have not done it already. That is one of the best ways that you can help to support this podcast. It'll only take you a couple minutes and it means the world. Also, I'm going to ask you, if you like the show, to please share this podcast with other women in your life. The entire intention behind producing this podcast is so that I can help untangle women from all of the crazy beliefs and and ideas that have been fed to them through the years by the diet and fitness industries. Not that they're all bad, but there's a lot of stuff that women are definitely tangled up in that is not serving them. And I want to help women to improve their health by teaching them how to take radical responsibility for their life. Not by encouraging them to chase outcomes in certain timeframes, which is what the diet and fitness industry often does, but by pursuing a life and a way of being that feels totally in line with who they are for the rest of their life. Because to me, that's what health is. It's not a destination. It's a lifetime journey. And in order to do that, I definitely need your help. I can market the heck out of this show, but nothing replaces your personal recommendations. So please spread this podcast near and far. You can share it on your social media pages. You can shoot it through email to friends and family. You can bring it up in coffee conversations with your girlfriends. Anything you can do to help me spread the word of this podcast would be amazing. Okay. Sorry to start the podcast by asking for something from you today. (laughs) Now, I have been struggling with a little bit of an upper respiratory thing. So this is actually the first day in five days that I've been able to speak. I lost my voice for almost five days. So this recording should go very interestingly. Those of you who may may have missed last week's episode, I want to tell you that the theme for the podcast in this month is modern day mental health. And last week, I talked a lot about lifestyle factors that have a really deep capacity to nourish or deplete the state of your mental health. So if you missed that episode, I would strongly encourage you to go back and revisit it because I think it will make the rest of the conversation on the podcast this month make a lot more sense. Now this week, I want to give you some specific tools that can really help you to manage your mind so you can more easily move through obstacles that you will surely face if you commit to any kind of change in your life and get you into a space of really learning how to practice showing up for yourself in the way that you've always wanted to, right? Because health is a practice. And in order to practice, we need to show up. And that's where so many people are struggling. So I'm going to teach you three steps to very simply manage your mental landscape. But please don't hear me saying that simple is easy because it's often not. And I'll speak a little bit to why I don't think it's easy also today later in the show. But the three steps I want to talk about today are first and foremost, clearing the physical and mental clutter from your life. Second to that, I want to talk about noticing and naming your thoughts and your emotions, so your internal landscape. And finally, I want to talk about the power of learning how to feel 
with intention. These are all things that have been incredibly powerful along my own journey. And I have worked with these concepts with many, many of my clients over the years, and they have proven to be very successful for them as well. So let's start with talking about clearing the physical and mental clutter from your life. Just to be clear, the definition of clutter is a collection of things lying around in an untidy mess. And when most people think of clutter, they think of the stuff in their homes or in their office space or in their cars. And while I'm a big believer that physical clutter can hugely impact your mental health in a negative way, the clutter I really want to talk about today is the mental clutter and lifestyle clutter. If clutter is a collection of things lying around in an untidy mess, can you see how this would apply to your mental state? Most people are walking around with a giant mess in their brains because they simply have no practices for clearing the mental clutter. So what sort of practices am I referring to? These are things I've talked about many times on the podcast. Things like meditation, journaling, long walks in nature. Hell, even something as simple as coloring. I'm a really big fan of setting up a morning routine. This is something I teach most of my clients. Because morning routines allow us to get ourselves centered and our head on straight before we go out and try to rescue the rest of the world. And part of my morning routine, and something that I always encourage my clients to incorporate in their morning routines, is inserting some sort of practice that helps to clear the mental clutter. I don't know what that looks like specifically for you, but it could be one of the things that I just mentioned. A short meditation, a journaling exercise, a walk outside, even coloring in a coloring book. I will tell you, I've mentioned this before, I do not in any way, shape, or form consider myself a master of meditation, not by a long shot. But I've been working with meditation for many, many years, and I'm a really big fan of guided meditations. For me, that's what works best. And there are two apps that I strongly recommend people check out. I have no affiliation with these, by the way. This is just because I think they're very useful that I'm sharing this with you. The first one is the Waking Up app with Sam Harris. Awesome stuff. He has a five-day free beginner meditation course that is completely worth taking. I don't care what your experience is with meditation. And the other one that I recommend is Insight Timer, specifically anything by Sarah Blondin. She, too, on that app, has a free seven-day beginner meditation course that is pure gold, regardless of your level or experience with meditation. So those might be a couple starting points for some of you. But even if it's not meditation, I want you to consider here and now, what are you doing or what are you willing to start doing on a daily basis to help you clear your mental clutter. A lot of you have heard me speak about my daily brain dumps, which is a practice of getting everything that is clogging my brain out onto paper. And my brain dumps only take me a matter of minutes, and they make me feel as if I have taken an enormous weight off my shoulders. Because I have. I have gotten everything in my head out onto paper, and I am literally lighter for it. 
Now, I think it's really important to clarify that I do three different types of brain dumps. All right. So the first type is really with the specific intent of purging all of my mental clutter. So that looks like first thing in the morning, putting pen to page and emptying the contents of my brain. I first learned this by doing Artist Way. A lot of you will know that book, which is basically a practice of writing nonstop, right, for three minutes. So you never let the pen leave the page for three minutes, and you don't censor what you write. You're just getting all of your thoughts out on paper. And when I was first introduced to that practice, that was probably about 15 years ago, I found it so incredibly liberating and stress-reducing. It kind of feels like cleaning out an overstuffed closet. So definitely just purging with the specific intent of clearing mental clutter is a very powerful practice. And it's really powerful, I think, first thing in the day. And it doesn't have to take you more than five minutes. Now, the second type of brain dump I do is purging or getting all of the to-dos that are in my head that drive me crazy and create so much anxiety out onto paper and then scheduling everything that is really necessary and important for me to do into my calendar. So I no longer have to utilize my brain power to retain those items. That has also been a practice that I've cultivated for many, many years And it has proven to be really powerful in my life. Very stress-reducing. Now, the third type of brain dump I do is something that I learned specifically from Brooke Castillo. And it's called the thought download. And the thought download is basically when I'm faced with a difficult decision or difficult situation in my life. I write out all of my thoughts about that particular challenge. So I can see my thoughts and I can start selecting the thoughts that are most useful to me. And I'll talk about that a little bit later in the episode today. But basically, I'm literally selecting thoughts that are going to help me cultivate the results that I truly want for my life. So like I said, I'll go into a little deeper dive later on in the show about that specific download, that brain dump, which is the thought download. But let's next talk about lifestyle clutter. Lifestyle clutter to me is a result of living life at a really high velocity. Being so busy that you don't really have any time to make a conscious decision. And I would argue that, of course, this is how most people are living this day and age. I'm a big believer that the fast pace at which most of us are living our lives has created an obscene amount of clutter in our lives. When we're living at such a fast pace with so much on our to-do list. We can't help but react to life rather than respond to life. It's literally the difference between living life awake and living life half asleep. Consciousness versus unconsciousness. Unconscious reaction. Because I really believe reaction is just an unconscious choice unfortunately bears a lot of nasty consequences. We react to life's challenges with anger, which ultimately costs us relationships. And trust me, I know on this one, I spoke about this in last week's episode, how I used to use anger as a protection mechanism for avoiding all other emotions that didn't feel good. And it cost me a lot. Many of you react to stress with food and alcohol 
which really ultimately creates a lot of unwanted health challenges. Many women that I work with, most women that I work with, are reacting to everyone else's crisis. They're constantly reacting to every email and every iPhone notification. Always reacting to other people's opinions. And none of that reacting leads to the level of health that they truly crave for their life. In fact, I would argue that all that reacting is leading you in the opposite direction. Reaction serves you really well when you touch a hot stove and you need to pull your hand away. Or your kid runs out into the street and you need to pull them out because there's an oncoming car. Reaction has a place. But living in a reactionary state, which is how most people are living their lives, is not how you shape a healthy and fulfilling life. A life you are proud of is not going to be born out of unconscious living. No. Designing and developing a life you are proud of requires that you slow the hell down and wake the hell up to the decisions that you are making every single day. And herein lies the problem, right? Making conscious decisions, responding to life rather than reacting, requires that we pause to consider our choices. We pause to ask ourselves, why am I making this decision? And I can already hear your response. I don't have time to pause. I don't have time to consider. I don't have time to ask questions. To which, if you've been listening to this podcast, you know what I'm going to say. How's that working for you? not having time to pause. It's not. Pretty sure you would not have selected this podcast if you didn't have some kind of challenge you were facing on your health journey. And I bet a lot, if not all, of the challenge you are facing along your health journey has a direct relationship to your inability to pause and consider and ask questions. So what I really hear when people tell me they don't have time is that they really just haven't yet made that a priority. So how about you do that today? How about right here, right now, you commit to pausing a little more frequently in your day to check in and have some conscious awareness around your choices. Check in and remove from your life all that isn't necessary or important to you right now, right? Which allows you to create some more time and space for yourself. And here's the thing. When I say create time and space for yourself, a lot of people immediately think of, okay, what can I cut out that I don't want to do? To which I often say, that's not enough. What what can you cut out that you do want to do? Because that's my problem. I'm a super excitable creature, I want to be a part of everything to my own demise, right? Committing to to too much of good things, to too many good things is also very depleting. So take a look at all the things on your schedule. Yes, the things you don't want to do, but also the things that you do want to do. Because you may have to trim some things that you do want to do to make time for what is most important to you right now. Which for a lot of women I speak to in the day is their health. They're so tired of feeling tired. They're so sick of feeling sick. And yet, they also often refuse to create time to practice things that will actually improve their state of health, mental or physical. Let's talk about the next step. So we've, we've talked about clearing the mental 
and the lifestyle clutter, right? And again, the lifestyle clutter is the busyness, starting to trim down the busyness in your life. Once you have a daily practice of clearing mental and lifestyle clutter, the next thing I strongly recommend people develop is a practice of noticing and naming. This is something I was originally introduced to through Precision Nutrition. Many of you listening know that I'm a Precision Nutrition Level 2 coach. So I have traveled along with Precision Nutrition for, I think it's been over a decade now. But they're a very research-based company that is very rooted in behavior change science, specifically around lifestyle change to improve health. So noticing, noticing and naming was a concept I originally learned from them, but I've been re- reintroduced to it through so many other pathways. Here's what you need to know. We humans are exceptionally good at avoiding and distracting ourselves from things that we don't want to feel, like loneliness, sadness, fear, disappointment. The thing is, all of the avoiding and distracting has created an enormous amount of discomfort and dis-ease in our life and in our bodies. And I would say one of the most highly used ways that people avoid and distract is through busyness which is what we were just speaking to. The fast pace at which we live is very addicting because it allows us to not really confront the problems in our life because we don't have time. How convenient. Just because you ignore something doesn't make it go away. It just makes the thing more dysfunctional in your life. So here's what I mean by that. Your marriage is falling apart, so you work all the time to avoid working on the relationship, which makes the relationship fall apart even quicker. You hate your job, so you eat and drink every day after work to reward yourself for surviving another day, which makes you feel like hell the next day. And a lot of self-loathing creeps in and you go to your job hating it even more. You create no time in your day to honor the fact that you need some downtime, which is how you rationalize staying up late at night to mindlessly scroll social media, which really just makes you feel worse, by the way, and makes you wake up the next day feeling worse because you didn't get enough sleep And now you definitely don't have any time in your day to take care of yourself. And so the vicious cycle continues. So here's an idea. How about facing the problems in your life rather than distracting yourself from them? Well, you know why, right? You know why you're not doing that. If you don't know, I'll tell you. Because you don't want to feel certain emotions. It's a lot easier to distract yourself from problems than to deal with the problems. Or at least that's the story we tell ourselves. Because the truth of the matter is, all the distracting, all the avoiding actually creates much bigger problems in our life. So we're afraid of being vulnerable with our spouse. So we just go to work. We just work more. So we don't have to be vulnerable. We don't want to feel the discomfort of pursuing work that we actually love and don't need to escape from every night. So we stay in a job that we hate. We don't want to face the discomfort or the fear of setting boundaries with other people, with ourselves. We don't want to ask for help. So we don't have any time for ourselves each day. And so we continue to stay in that cycle of staying up late at night so we get a little bit of time for ourselves. Doing things, by the way, that usually don't matter at all. Social media is not enhancing your life in any way. 
I promise you. Well, unless you're a member of my free Facebook group. (laughs) In that way, it might enhance your life a little bit. But come on, most of what we're seeing on Facebook or Instagram or any social media channel, it's fluff. It's not important stuff. So here's what I want you to be curious about. How about facing the emotions themselves? Feeling the emotions that you're so afraid of, that you're constantly avoiding and distracting yourself from? How about accepting that feeling the full spectrum of emotion is a very real and important part of the human experience? Without the lows, we don't get to experience the highs. That's why there's a spectrum of emotion. But somehow, our culture got into the space of of promoting that we should only be feeling the highs. But you can't feel the highs without the opposition. But we have somehow created all this fear and shame around feeling harder emotions. We've kind of rejected their beauty and their importance. How would your life change if you could feel your emotions all the way through and stop running from them. I bet you deal with a lot more challenges in your life rather than escaping them. What if you could stop all the things you are doing to avoid and distract yourself from feeling difficult emotion? How would your life change? I bet it would change in some pretty profound ways. So where does one start? to face emotion. And again, I'm talking about difficult emotion. I don't like to say good or bad because I think all emotion is important emotion. But there are some emotions that are more difficult for us to feel than others. So where do you start with that? You know where you start? You start by simply pausing. There's the damn pause again that no one has time for. You start by pausing throughout the day to acknowledge what you're feeling and to even question what you're thinking that's driving that emotion. This is noticing and naming. But again, to pause, you have to slow the hell down and be willing to seek and find You have to be willing to get to know yourself intimately without judgment and with a whole lot of fascination and curiosity about your humanness. As you go through your day today, I would challenge you to give yourself permission to pause often and much throughout the day. And it doesn't have to be an epic pause. We're talking about a few seconds of pausing. And notice what you feel. Notice what you feel in your body. Notice what you feel emotionally. And try to name precisely what it is you're feeling. That in itself is such a powerful exercise. And then... You can take it a step further by starting to unpack the thoughts that are creating those feelings. Because believe me, there are thoughts under there that will shock and awe you. And the only way that I can do this effectively is by writing them down. So when I notice that I'm feeling anxious, I notice that I'm feeling intimidated, I notice I'm feeling disappointed, I write down the things I am thinking that are underneath that feeling. And sometimes I don't know. I just put pen to page and I just start to explore why might I be feeling anxious? Why might I be feeling disappointed? And nine times out of 10, I can pretty much pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. This is a thought download. So I could be thinking something like, when I think I'm going to fail, you know, I think I'm going to fail at this and everyone's going to judge me. And that's why I'm feeling terrified. 
I have so much on my plate and I have, you know, I haven't been sleeping much and I'm feeling just really pressured to get things done. That's a thought that is creating a lot of anxiety. I am telling you one of the most significant things I have learned how to do to improve my own mental health is by, number one, slowing my life the hell down. Number two, giving myself permission to pause throughout the day to check in with myself. And number three, starting to connect the dots between what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. It is so empowering. You are driving your emotional state by how you think. Now, I am not saying that there are not other contributing factors that can influence your mental state. We talked a lot about those factors last week. But a large majority of us are suffering tremendously because of our own unconscious thinking. So get conscious about it. You don't have to keep thinking those things. Thoughts are not happening to you. There's something that you choose, and they are something you can unchoose. There's something you can replace with better thoughts. So once you've done the thought download and you've started to unpack the thoughts that are driving your emotional state, you ask yourself, is this useful to me? Is this thought, I am going to fail, and everyone is going to judge me, useful to me. Well, that could be applied to many situations, but I would say boldly that I can think of no situation in which that would be useful to you. So why keep thinking it? There are other things you could also think about the situation that are also true that would drive a completely different emotional state. You know what? I'm really nervous right now, but I'm also really excited because this is important to me. And I know this is going to help me to make big change in my life. And nobody's opinion matters as much as my opinion of myself matters. Just those words drive a completely different emotional state in me than thinking purely I'm going to fail and everyone's going to judge me. It's really important that you start to take responsibility for how you are thinking and the emotions that is causing you. So the final step I want to talk about is once you've done these thought downloads and you've started to connect the things you are feeling with thoughts that you are thinking, You have options, and you get to consciously decide. You get to feel on purpose, and here's what I mean by that. When I notice that I'm thinking, I'm going to fail at this, and everyone's going to judge me, I feel anxious. So I could definitely keep that thought and eat my emotions, or drink my emotions, or social media my emotions, do anything to avoid and distract myself from it. This is how most people will choose to live their life. They know there's a connection vaguely. They haven't done necessarily maybe the work to see it clearly. But it's a lot easier to avoid and distract ourselves from it than it is to face it head on. That is a choice. But the other choice is that you keep the thought and intentionally feel it all the way through. So let's just say that I'm about to give a really big presentation to a large audience, and I'm a little anxious. I'm also excited, but I'm anxious because I've never talked to this many people. I could choose to keep that thought if I found it useful, which I honestly don't know if I would keep that thought. I'd probably change it out. But let's just say I decided to keep the thought. And I know that the thought is going to create some anxiety. And so now I have to learn how to sit with anxiety without fixing it, 
without numbing it. Because what we do to numb and avoid is usually coming at a much steeper cost. So let's say someone, um, I know Brooke Castillo uses this example a lot of somebody dying, right? When someone dies who's close to us, we choose to feel sad. We don't want to necessarily change our thoughts in order to feel good about that person dying. So that is an example of intentionally feeling sadness. I'm feeling sad. I'm acknowledging that. And I'm going to intentionally feel sad. That's a very compassionate thing to do. I'm disappointed that something didn't work out. And maybe I choose to feel intentionally disappointed for a while. That's compassionate. But what's not compassionate is unconsciously feeling something like disappointment, not understanding what you're feeling or why you're feeling it, and then covering it up with a bunch of things that help you numb it or distract from it, like food and alcohol. And there's 10,000 other ways that we cover things up, right? Work, again, social media, shopping, porn, gambling. I mean, good, good Lord, we have no end to those, what we call those false pleasures. So I can keep the thought and avoid and distract myself from it, which is going to create a whole host of problems in my life. I can keep the thought and intentionally feel it all the way through and understand that that's actually a very compassionate thing to do as long as it's useful to me. Or I can change the thought to something that is more useful and move my emotional landscape in a different direction. So like I used the example earlier, instead of thinking I'm going to fail at this and everyone's going to judge me, I might think something like, this is really important to me. And I acknowledge that I'm a little nervous about this right now, but I know that this is going to move my life to higher ground and it's a risk worth taking and nobody's opinion of me trumps my own. Right? Like giving myself a little pep talk. It's amazing how quickly it can turn sort of frustration and disappointment and, um, you know, a hard emotion into something that just feels more useful. It's helping me to move my life. It's helping me to take the next step. And to me, that's what radical responsibility is. Right? It's taking those measures that will help move our life in a healthier direction. So just once again, the three steps that I mentioned to help you manage your mental landscape today are first, building practices that will help you clear the the mental and lifestyle clutter from your life. The second was starting to pause throughout the day to notice and name what you're feeling and to start connecting those feelings with the thoughts. What am I thinking that's driving these emotions? And finally, I talked about feeling with intention, choosing to feel something hard, like I'm going to go to a new fitness class today and I'm going to choose discomfort on purpose because I know that by walking into that class, I'm going to feel a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to choose that on purpose because this is really important to me. That's another example of feeling with intention. You acknowledge that the hard emotion is there and you're willing to rumble with it. Not avoid it, not distract yourself from it, but feel it all the way through. Let it, let it travel with you. It just wants to be in the passenger seat. It just wants to be acknowledged. And sometimes, oftentimes, you are going to find out very quickly that some of the thoughts you have are very unuseful to you They're causing emotions and unnecessary suffering in your life. And so you are going to choose consciously to think something different. Something that is also true, but is going to move your life in a different direction. So two things I want to say um, in closing about those three steps. Any kind of practice requires an immense amount of repetition. Reps, reps, reps. You will become a master of none of this overnight. You may not become a master of it in your lifetime. 
perfect. It doesn't matter. It is a, these are all practices worth pursuing because they will nourish the state of your mental health, which will enable you to better care for your physical health. And the last thing I will say is there is no way on God's green earth I could have done any of this work in my own life without the help of coaches, without the help of mentors. So I, when something, I I have always been one of those people who recognizes when something's important to me, when there's a big change that I want to make, I will reach out and ask for help from somebody who's traveled a little further ahead than I have. So I don't have to make a lot of unnecessary pit stops. Not saying that I, I'm not going to make mistakes. Of course I am. But if I can travel alongside of someone who's already traveled the road, I'm going to do it because it's going to make my journey a lot easier and hopefully um, omit a lot of unnecessary struggle. So I'm a big fan of coaching trainers, teachers, mentors. So seriously, it's worth an investment. I don't care if you do that with me or you do it with somebody else. I'm just saying that if you're committed to really improving the state of your mental health, it is worth pursuing somebody that can help you do that. Okay, I think that's it. I hope this was helpful. It's a lot of information. I could probably do an entire month just on what the conversation we had today. But we have a lot of other ground to cover. I have some really awesome guests coming in the next couple of weeks. I hope you will join me for that. I always love hearing your feedback. And like I said at the beginning of the podcast, please consider leaving a review or at the very least, share this podcast with other women in your life who you think could use this level of support and this level of education. Thank you, my friends. I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you again next week. Thank you for listening to the Grace and Grit podcast. It is time to mend the fabric of the female health story. And it starts with you taking radical responsibility for your own self-care. You are worth the effort. And with a little Grace and Grit, anything is possible. Anything is possible.